Hi, my name's Andy, and this is a video where I'll show you how I wrote Snake in Kotlin.js and uh, let you know how I felt about Kotlin.js after that experience. Um, uh, I'll start off by justifying why I would write Snake. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Kotlin, uh, um, uh, what Kotlin is, what Kotlin.js is. There'll be a bit of love for Kotlin. Um, then I'll talk about how it feels to write this code, uh, what it's like to actually deploy it, um, and make it make it run actually on the web. Um, some conclusions. Uh, also a little bit about how many lines of code different uh, versions of Snake take. Uh, but first, I must prove to you that I really wrote Snake in Kotlin, uh, in Kotlin JS. So here it is. Uh, this is the Snake game, which you'll recognise from previous videos, because uh, it's almost exactly the same. Written in Kotlin JS, it really works. Okay. That's enough proof for you. Um, so, uh, why Snake? Well, Snake is quite an easy uh, game to write, especially for me because I've written it a lot of times now. Um, but it does require some basic programming constructs like arrays and loops and uh, things like that. Also, it requires user interface and input, um, which uh, if you're just evaluating a programming language from a kind of theoretical point of view, you might not consider stuff like that. Um, and often stuff like that, the kind of painful bits, uh, are where you find out what, what really, um, makes it work or not work. Uh, so yeah, I, I like playing Snake. I like writing Snake. Uh, bit about Kotlin. What's Kotlin? Well, Kotlin is, um, like Java. It's kind of intended to be an improved Java, um, where they took all the things about Java that make me sad, or almost all, many of the things about Java that make me sad, and fix them, and fix them in ways that I like. Um, what they've done is they've um, made it a lot less code for stuff that you do quite frequently in Java, um, and especially uh, the patterns that I like, they've made easy and short to code. Um, Kotlin um, kind of started off on the JVM, or at least that's its kind of... Um, its kind of most natural platform, but actually... Uh, Kotlin code will compile down to code that runs on the JVM, at JVM as in the same place Java can run, but also compiles to machine codes um, for native programs, um, and also can compile to uh, JavaScript, which is what we're looking at today. Um, so, what is Kotlin JS? Well, it's all of Kotlin, including all the standard libraries of Kotlin, uh, compiles Compiles down to JavaScript, which will run either in Node.js or in the uh, web browser. Um, and you can talk to the browser's DOM when you're in the web browser. Um, it can compile to the most common JavaScript module formats. Um, what it can't do is use um, your Java library um, when you're compiling down to Kotlin.js, which of course you can do when you're compiling down to the JVM. But you can use the standard libraries of Kotlin. Uh, we love Kotlin. Um, especially those of us who have to write Java, love Kotlin. Uh, if you don't have to write Java, you might not understand what all the fuss is about. Um, but it frees us from some of that pain. So um, gives us null safety and smart casting, which I'll show you. Uh, data classes, which are brilliant, and name parameters, um, again, which I'll show you. Also, some things can be a bit immutable. You can, uh, stream stuff is a bit less painful uh, than if you're writing Java. Um, you get closures, you get operator overloading, asynchronous stuff, extension functions. Uh, so here's an example, null safety. Um, so here's a little bit of code. Uh, we're making an X, a variable X, uh, which is a string, or it could be null because um, our first argument that gets passed in uh, might be might not exist, in which case um, X will be null. And then we try and print out uh, the length of that string. And the Kotlin compiler says no, um, because the type of X is string question mark instead of just string, um, you're not allowed to call methods on it. And first you have to check whether it's um, null before you can use it. Um, so if the type was just string, this wouldn't compile because first or null returns something which is a string question mark, not just a string. So something that might be null. Um, and so uh, what smart casts means is stuff like this is now fine. So if you check that X is null, the compiler magically knows that that null check means that the type of X can now be treated as just string instead of string question mark. 
Um, so the Kotlin that you write quite often can look like the Java that you would have written, where you check for null first, um, but actually the type system is recognizing that and reflecting that in that code. So you might like that, you might not. I'll tell you what, it's better than not having it at all. Uh, data classes. So these are um, uh, a way of writing uh, stuff that you would have had had to write a huge amount of code for um, in Java, uh, which um, which does a whole load of stuff like writes an equals function for you, a hash code function, getters and setters for the values. If you make a data class, um, you're telling Kotlin basically write all of that code for me. So here we've got a class called point, which has um, uh, properties x and y, it has an equals function, um, it even has a toString function. Um, it's all that code's written for you. This is this is some code from the real um, snake program. Um, also, you have name parameters. So here's an example. We're using name parameters to call the constructor of the point class. By the way, you don't use the word new when you construct things. Um, so you don't have to put x equals and y equals, but if it makes your code clearer and easier to understand, uh, name parameters, pretty cool. Uh, immutability, so again, looking at um, the same point class, notice that uh, x is listed here as a val instead of a var. That means that um, it can't be changed. So when we try and change it like this, the compiler says, well, no, it's a val, so you can't change it. That's like final in Java. Um, note, though, it's, it's not exactly what you might want. If we make a point, which is a val, but the properties of point are vars, you can still change the properties of that point object, even though you uh, created it with a val keyword. So it is just like final uh, in Java. It's a shallow immutability. It just means you can't change that particular reference. Other things. OK, so uh, you can write streaming code, which is possible to read, uh, which is not true in other situations. Um, so here's how we apply a function um, we run a function for every element in a list. Again, this is some code from the actual snake program. We're making a body. We want it to be made out of four points, uh, five, four points. Um, so we make a list from zero to four. I think that's five points. I can't remember. Um, and then we call the map function on that list. And that calls a function uh, that we give it for every element of that list. So the function it calls is actually to make a, a, a point is a little closure, which is what the curly brackets are for, um, which makes a point. So you end up with a list of points out of this. Uh, maybe you think that's not as easy to read as if we just made a list of points in some other way. Um, uh, if you like Ruby, this uh, might be nice. Um, but also, um, this pattern in some circumstances for processing through lists of things can be really nice. Uh, in Kotlin, it genuinely is really nice, and not just in theory would be nice if Java wasn't so horrible to you. Uh, closures, so the bit in the curly brackets, as I said, is a closure. So that's just a tiny little reusable function, or uh, you know, tiny little function you can pass in as an argument to another thing. So here the map function uh, method is actually a method that takes an argument, which is a closure. There's a little bit of syntactic sugar there, meaning you don't need the round brackets uh, to show that map is a function call. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't. Uh, so, how does it feel to use Kotlin.js? Well, here's a little bit of our Kotlin.js for our Snake program. You'll notice that you're getting hold of a document and a window. Uh, you're calling document.getElementById um, to get hold of um, something in the browser DOM. Um, and you're setting window.onResize to something to basically respond to resize events um, when the window gets changed. So if you've written any uh, JavaScript recently, uh, DOM manipulating JavaScript particularly, this is going to look like almost the same as the JavaScript that you wrote to do that, with a little bit of extra type information in there. So often when you're writing Kotlin.js and working with the browser, it feels like JavaScript with types or maybe TypeScript. In fact, the Kotlin.js um, libraries build on the library of TypeScript stuff. Um, so actually, it's actually using the information that the TypeScript people have um, gathered together about all the types of different things in the JavaScript world, reusing that. So you get um, you get um, 
magic completion of stuff, like when you say document dot, then um, if you're using IntelliJ to write your Kotlin, it will pop up and get element by ID will be one of the options in the list. So it uses the type information, but it feels like JavaScript, um, or it looks like JavaScript when you're writing it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But wait. Also, um, you you have code that looks a bit like this, which um, if you've written any Kotlin, um, I suggest feels a bit like Kotlin. So at the top we we're using the um, any um, method to do some kind of streamy stuff. So check basically check whether we've collided. Uh, our head has um, collided with any of the points on the body by saying is is anything the same as head? That feels a bit Kotlinish. Um, also that um, little bit of code uh, again it just feels like Kotlin uh, looks like Kotlin so does it feel like JavaScript does it feel like Kotlin well sometimes when you're writing just pure code like this it feels like Kotlin when you're manipulating the DOM it feels like typed JavaScript um, and here's an example that kind of mixes the two situations so here um, we're getting hold of um, a, a context which we can use to draw on a canvas. Uh, and then we're calling the fill text function, so that's a JavaScript um, function. For anyone who's familiar with uh, drawing on a canvas in JavaScript, that will look normal. But then if you look at the string that we're actually choosing to draw on that canvas, um, we're using Kotlin's uh, string substitution syntax here with the dollar curly brackets. Um, so it feels like Kotlin, but it feels like JavaScript. It feels like you can call all the JavaScript APIs, but you can use Kotlin objects. You, you can use all the Kotlin syntax. Um, it feels good. It feels like what you would uh, ask for if you wanted like a a JavaScript with with things you like from Kotlin. So yeah, it feels like there's no friction. There's no there's no kind of um, kachunk where you have to switch between um, I'm writing Kotlin or no, I'm writing JavaScript. Um, but what that means is, in order to use the JavaScript bits, you need to know JavaScript, or at least the JavaScript libraries. In order to write the Kotlin stuff, obviously you need to write Kotlin. So with any, just like with any um, uh, combination of two worlds like this, you do actually have to know both worlds in order to use it effectively. Um, but yeah, I can definitely say it is designed with real world operability in mind. Um, there's a tutorial section about how to do Kotlin.js with React, which is one of the most popular JavaScript you know, UI libraries. Um, they've really, just the same way that Kotlin feels completely friction free when you're working with an existing Java uh, library, uh, Kotlin.js feels completely friction free when you're working with an existing JavaScript library. As I mentioned, it uses the, um, the type definitions that have been worked out for TypeScript, which is this definitely types.org website. So the popular JavaScript libraries um, should just give you auto-completion and just work nicely. Uh, it also has support for libraries that it doesn't know about that you can just use with kind of uh, dynamic types um, and you're on your own. Um, so yeah, using Kotlin.js is a, a big contrast with um, some of the other uh, front-end stuff that I've talked about on my channel before, um, especially Elm, which is a completely different world. Elm says everything you've learned before is wrong. Um, you should use this new programming language. You should use these libraries written in that new programming language that work the way that new programming language works. Uh, throw out everything you know about the old world. Kotlin.js says um, uh, you know how you like the old world, and you know how you like Kotlin, well, let's just have them both. Um, so I guess which one you prefer is very much down to what you're trying to achieve and what type of stuff you like. Um, but yeah, Elm tells you, I know everything best, and I'm going to make everything good and right. And Kotlin JS says, wouldn't you like things to be a little bit better in the world that you're already in? So how does it feel to actually deploy it? Um, well, if we look in our index.html, we can see we have to include um, a couple of bits of JavaScript. We have to include the, the Kotlin standard library, which is kotlin.js, and our own code, which is snake-kotlin.js.js. Um, 
Yeah, great naming by me. Um, so if we have a look inside the web directory, which is where the, the kind of deployed stuff ends up, once we've run our Gradle uh, command, because it's, um, it's it's all based on a Gradle command, just like um, it, as if you're writing Kotlin for the JVM. Uh, or at least that's the way I did it. Uh, yeah, so here's what's inside the web directory, so you can see those two things that I showed you. A couple of other .meta things, which are basically runtime type information. Um, I don't know what root package .kjsm is. Uh, if we have a look inside the JavaScript that got generated from the code that we wrote, it looks a bit like this. So this code is quite similar to what we saw earlier when we were looking at Kotlin code. So this is JavaScript that looks a bit like our Kotlin. So there's at least a decent chance uh, when you look at the Kotlin that's generated that you'll understand which bit of code you're looking at and how it got translated into JavaScript. I was quite impressed with, with how simple this is um, and not full of weird stuff I didn't understand. Um, uh, so if you have a look at, yeah, uh, uh, how much Kotlin code I wrote and then how much JavaScript came out of that. So there's a, there's a bunch of Kotlin files, but there's a total of 195 lines of Kotlin to write Snake. Um, and when that gets translated by Kotlin.js into JavaScript, you end up with 415 lines of JavaScript, uh, which is not too bad, especially given that some of the stream stuff um, uh, and the closures um, don't quite translate directly to JavaScript, so you end up having a whole load of functions created, which is reasonably easy to understand when you look at it. Um, so about twice as much JavaScript as the Kotlin I originally wrote, and fairly readable. On the other hand, uh, the Kotlin standard library that you get um, is 50,000 lines of code. Um, so that that's we're including that in our um, you, from our index.html, so that, that we're loading up that 50,000 lines of um, JavaScript code in order to have the Kotlin standard library. And if you open up that file and try and understand it, it is almost entirely incomprehensible gobbledygook about how the get or default underscore some weird characters method equals the get or default some underscore underscore some weird characters. There's a lot of lines that look like that. So I uh, was a bit unhappy with that. It makes me pretty sad to have um, a whole load of rubbish I, I don't understand. And I, I stumbled across this because I actually wanted to figure out what it was doing. So it's not like you can just ignore it. Um, I was, or at least I felt I couldn't ignore it because I really wanted to know what that get or default function actually did and whether it was um, just a JavaScript array underneath, uh, a JavaScript object underneath it or something else. Pretty sure it's not. I'm pretty sure it's they're implementing their own map in order to get behavior that's consistent with um, how the Kotlin standard library works. So, uh, uh, what's the conclusion? There's a whole load of code underneath your code, uh, which is not just what JavaScript gives you, it's what Kotlin gives you. Maybe that was inevitable. Uh, other interesting things about deployment, a credit here goes to PRN SML on GitHub, who's, who um, contributed to my GitHub repo. Um, you can do source mapping. So here, this is the debugger showing that you can step through uh, the snake code in your browser debugger because of source mapping, so that's cool. Uh, also, from PRN SML, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my comments about that fit those 50,000 lines of Kotlin.js, which is 2 meg uh, uh, on disk. Um, if you run dead code elimination, PRN SML let me know um, or showed me how. Um, you, you run dead code elimination as part of your Gradle build. That goes down to 192 kilobytes, uh, which is much better. This, of course, is in my example where I'm not using much of the standard library, so it could be bigger. Um, if you're actually writing more code, but uh, the snake game doesn't use much of the standard library, so it looks like a lot of that can be eliminated. Um, and also, if you use Uglify.js on that, using Node, the Node build tools, uh, or build tools that are based in the Node universe, uh, that actually can go down to 88k. So it's not that big in terms of uh, what gets loaded into your browser. Um, it won't be this huge download that makes life terrible. I still feel a bit sad that it's there's this incomprehensible stuff underneath my code. Um, but then, you know, when I'm using Elm, there's an 
a huge pile of incomprehensible stuff underneath my code. So, or maybe comprehensible. Uh, maybe that's comprehensible stuff because it's written in Elm. Uh, but then when it's running in the browser, it's fairly incomprehensible. So, apples with apples. I don't know. Um, it was big. It made me sad. PRN SML showed me how to make it small. It makes me less sad. So, what are my conclusions? Um, uh, Kotlin's really cool. Um, I still really like writing Kotlin compared with writing Java or uh, actually indeed JavaScript. Um, but um, choosing to go for a language that is not the native language of the web, which is JavaScript, um, is a huge commitment. It, it, it comes with a whole load of hassle and pain. Um, uh, and it just makes it harder to understand what's really happening. Um, if you decide that you don't want to go with JavaScript, um, Kotlin.js could definitely be a good choice for you. Also, a little bit just for your interest, really. Um, here's a little chart of how many lines of code it takes to write Snake in the languages that I have so far written it in. Um, you can see Groovy is down the bottom there with a lot of lines of code. Uh, Elm, interestingly, uh, close behind, even though my my experience with Elm was a great deal more positive than it was with Groovy. Um, uh, and notice that Kotlin JS um, is right up there with Python 3 as uh, uh, equal least verbose language if you exclude Sinclair Basic. We probably should exclude Sinclair Basic because it doesn't actually, the program that I wrote doesn't have the same uh, user interface as the others, whereas all the others have the same user interface. So apart from Sinclair Basic, which is obviously a far superior language to all of them, um, Kotlin is among the the uh, languages that produce, that, that require, um, when Andy writes a snake game, the least number of lines of code. Um, which, given that people tend to like Python because it's not very verbose, that implies to me, uh, people who say that might also be interested in Kotlin. I was uh, surprised by this. Um, but yeah, you don't have to write many lines of Kotlin to get a working program, which is cool. Um, if you like fun, check out my game, Rabbit Escape, on the um, Play Store or F-Droid for Android. Both of those are Android stores. Um, uh, or you can download it for your PC. Um, have a look at artificialworlds.net to find out what I've been up to or what projects I'm uh, I'm working on um, read my blog at artificialworlds.net slash blog follow me on social media Andy Balaam at mastodon.social and also some um, outdated social media and uh, see you next time